Okay, so first thing is, let's take a look at the philosophy of the very large and the very small. Our topic today is on the very small. And a couple, whatever, weeks ago, uh, we had a panel on gravity, which uh, ended up talking about the very large. So today we're going to talk about that. Now, this is a slide. Good. Okay. This is a slide from the um, panel on gravity with a few uh, additions here. Essentially about, yeah, I'm, I've muted the second life thing. Okay. So essentially about a century ago or around the turn of the last century, 1900, if you're using that calendar, um, we were still, we meaning uh, everybody pretty much, uh, was still using kind of classic physics. In other words, Newtonian, flat space. Uh, we knew about two forces, gravity, electromagnetism. And atoms were only theoretical. It was basically a, a construct that was uh, some people thought existed and some people didn't. Um, partly, when we start talking about the unfamiliar, last time when we talked about gravity or we started talking about Einstein and relativistic mechanics, and now we're now at the bottom end. We're both uh, in the world of the extremely small and also in some cases the extremely fast quantum field theory. So this is really uh, a world quite removed from our own where things don't always behave the way they do. Now, what I mean by that is when we, when we, whoever, the French, I guess, made up meters, um, we were about it, you know, a couple, a meter or two as far as our cells and things we use. And then our limits of our senses essentially were on the lower scale down toward like the smallest human hair as far as being able to see it or touch or whatever, up to the tallest of mountains, 10,000 meters or so. Um, but there is a lot of the universe, <laughs> both in the small and the large, that are at scales that are far exceed that, both in, in, in small world and in large. Coronavirus, for example, is at about, uh, and Max might back me up, that, or uh, if tagline's there, uh, about 10 to the minus four, I think, yeah, thank you. Okay, as far as uh, 10 to the minus 4 meters, which means, or 7, or somewhere around there. But in any case, we can't see them. And things that we're going to talk about today, like protons, are way <laughs> smaller than anything that we can even imagine. Uh, same thing with the solar system. It's hard to imagine how big that is. Um, and then we go further out into space, uh, light years 10 to the 16th um, meters. So we're going to be talking about worlds that are far removed and ours only on the small side. Now, in order for something to exist that's kind of on the small side, that we're going into philosophy here, is you kind of have to imagine it before it exists. Now, it does exist. You can't just jump off a cliff and say, I don't believe in gravity because uh, you're going to be surprised. You know, the fall doesn't kill you, right? It's the sudden stop at the end. Um, but back in the really old days, a um, long time ago, in, by human standards, um, Democritus, one of the philosophers back there, in fact, the only thing they could do is basically philosophy and a little bit of instrumentation having to do with math. But he said that there must be a limit to how far you could cut a stone. I mean, you could take a hammer, hit a stone, great, okay, it gets into little pieces, but essentially it's still a stone, and you can continue, yeah, there you go, put some geology in there. Uh, you can continue to hit it, and no matter how much you hit it, even if it's a powder, it's still tiny little stones. If you've ever looked at sand under a microscope, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, good. i got to know more about him. Um, any case, so he called this an atomless, uh, meaning uncuttable. Now, on the other hand, not many people have heard of Democritus because there were other names which basically uh, had the floor, and they said, um, yeah, okay, Zeno, yeah. So Zeno, there was a paradox that he basically said, look, a runner can't really reach the end or of a race because after they go halfway, they can continue to go halfway and then halfway again and halfway again. 
And so they shouldn't be able to reach the end. Well, that's kind of interesting because essentially that's hap that happens with speed of light uh, is you can continue getting closer to the speed of light, closer and closer, um, but physically it really won't allow you to do that. <laughs> yeah, Zeno's power. Oh, yeah, well, I do too. But it's an but but the uh, gist of it is people basically their tools were their minds. They couldn't yet look at things that were very big or very small. So then we have speaking of hating uh, paradoxes, uh, we have what's called dogma. Dogma is essentially some authority going, uh, "This is what we believe, therefore this is what you believe, or else." And so uh, there's a lot of it, including science, has had kind of created dogma. And uh, natural philosophy kind of came out of uh, philosophy as the study of the physical world, kind of independent of humans. In other words, what uh, would there be if there that, that isn't created by uh, humans that's independent of it? And then kind of like an encounter. Our minds are, are wonderful things, but we can imagine a lot has no basis in reality. Uh, I can probably do a whole lecture on that today as far as what people believe about things. But to counter this, we came up with science. And then science is very closely uh, linked to the scientific merit method, which essentially says, okay, careful collection, treatment, interpretation of empirical data, private conclusions. Um, and we, we kind of went from, okay, let's step back out of this thing, positivism. In other words, let's try not to interfere with the things. And then we finally realized there's no way that we can step back out of a problem or an experiment. And so we can at least be transparent as to our biases and how the data may have been skewed, et cetera. Uh, transparency. Okay. So now, how, what does this have to do with particle physics? Well... There has been some scientific dogma over the time. In other words, okay, the Earth is the center of the universe. That was around for a long time. Humans, humans are a special creation above the animals. Of course, now we know, <laughs> you know, we're just an animal. Um, and we uh, can, um, we're just an animal, okay. And then ether is basically a substance that permeates all of space. All of those kind of went away as we learned um, more about the physical world, but when we got to the atom about a, thinking about the atom only about a century ago, it was still a theoretical construct to explain phenomena. Some people had used it, like Newton basically said that, yeah, uh, um, well, that's a good question, Shiloh, and yeah, he didn't have calculus. Okay, so that's a good question, Silo, about ether. But my understanding is ether, yeah, ether does not exist. It's just a construct because we couldn't imagine a world that didn't have, in other words, like a vacuum. And nobody could make a perfect vacuum. So um, essentially it was a construct, much like the atom was before about a century ago. And so Newton kind of explained, it says, okay, when you, when you open up, gas, gas atoms are rushing out into space. And then Dalton, uh, anybody that knows chemistry knows the uh, name of Dalton. He basically looked at, although he got the ratios wrong, he basically said, and we've heard stuff like H2O, CO2, in other words, two hydrogens per uh, and one oxygen and two oxygens and one carbon as having fixed ratios. And he kind of uh, looked at uh, matter as having atoms. But the and the reason I'm mentioning this is because when we talk about science, you've got um, empiricists like Ernst Mach in a dead century ago. And he basically says, okay, if we can't observe it, let's not make up things like atoms. In other words, let's just do, let's just look at the stuff that we can observe. So essentially you had those kind of things working against people at the beginning of the last century. But, hey, we found out that the atom is indeed cuttable. Here again, the word atom means uncuttable. So now, spoiler alert, this is where we're going. Um, this is what's called, this is the modern day right now, 2021, uh, our look at um, particles. And there's a lot of them. And so we'll kind of wander through here. 
and see how we got there. But it's kind of a spoiler alert. This is, this is what we know today. Yeah. Okay, so how do you observe an atom? In other words, if you can't, yeah, oi, exactly. Okay, so if you can't observe an atom, what do you do? How do you, well, first of all, you see how things behave. In other words, it's kind of like dinosaur footprints. Is that doesn't, just because we can't see a dinosaur walking around except for Jurassic Park um, or, you know, in a movie, um, uh, we want to see how they behave and their traces and basically their footprints. So electromagnetism, we understood fairly well. And the electromagnetic theory had been created uh, by Maxwell in the 1880s. And so we could see, well, well, how do these little part? How does how does stuff behave under electric magnetic field? And then radioactivity was discovered right around the same time period. And then somebody got really clever um, and invented the cloud chamber, which is essentially a let's say it's really really foggy inside, and if you have a foggy windshield and a little speck of dust or anything can start a streak. And essentially, that's what you have in a cloud chamber. Very, very interesting way to look at stuff um, that you really can't see. It just it creates a footprint in a very foggy chamber. And then uh, somebody went up in a balloon and discovered, whoa, there's these high energy particles, uh, which they called cosmic rays. By the way, the um, uh, telescopes uh, out in space, um, I'm trying to remember which one, but uh, in the 20, around 2013 or so, discovered that um, a lot of cosmic rays come, or in the 2000s anyway, just discovered come from supernovae and other high energy events, uh, and also the uh, black holes and other places. Okay, happy vernal equinox, everyone. Oh, it is. Eh, cool. Well, it's still, yeah, or a terminal equinox if you happen to be down under. Okay, so, and and another way to do it is instead of uh, smashing a stone with a hammer, you essentially smash atoms with other little particles. You worm around really close to the speed of light and whammo and see what flies out. Okay. And so uh, those are the methods we use to take a look at things, um, atoms. So let's kind of take a look at how some of this was explored from a century ago to today. Well, as I said, the first thing we do is we use some uh, electricity or magnetism. And over there in the far right, if you want to zoom in on stuff, upper right, you've got J.J. Thompson. And he's got a evacuated glass tube. And he's shooting electrons uh, toward the end of it. Oh, thank you. Um, they're a little busy, but <laughs> I'm trying to explain. But I'm trying to at least explain what's going on in them. Um, yeah, lots of info, and part of it so that you can look at this again if it's online. Um, oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, that's what happened later when we do atomic particles accelerate and then wham into each other um, later on. Okay, so J.J. Thompson had this evacuated glass tube, and he shot electrons into it. And then, lo and behold, he found that using a magnet, the... Uh, stream which he couldn't see curved and he could see it at the end of the tube it was kind of scintillating on the glass by the way don't try this at home this is how, also how you create x-rays um they didn't know that kind of stuff back then so don't do it <laughs> um but if you look at where it says television in the far in the right on the far right this is how televisions were created essentially the same way with a phosphor type of screen and being able to control electron beam up until we had flat screens. So uh, that's kind of where that went. Now, the other thing is uh, Rutherford, who was a student of Thompson, um, discovered radioactivity. Um, well, at least what he discovered was there were particles. Uh, in other words, radioactive particles, an alpha particle, which we now know is actually two protons and two neutrons, in other words, a helium atom stripped of its electrons, and a beta particle, which we now know is a proton. We'll talk about that in a second. 
or no, 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 no. Sorry, beta particles are electrons. Alpha particles contain proton atoms. Got it. Okay. And then gamma rays, which are really, really high energy radiation above X-rays. And those are essentially, the reason why you call it alpha, beta, gamma, by the way, is it's uh, in order of least penetration. In other words, alpha ray is going to essentially be stopped by a piece of paper, your skin, whatever. Um, and gamma rays really can't. It, they're very high energy. Well, so you have electrons, which are negative. You've got these alpha particles, which are positive. And so um, you've got Niels Bohr then. What uh, Rutherford and then Niels Bohr did was they, uh, Rutherford in particular, was he shot alpha particles at uh, gold atoms. And lo and behold, what happened? They, most of them went through. So it's like, okay, how come they're going through? So it must be mostly empty space, but every once in a while, um, they bounce back or they bounce at different uh, angles, but just every once in a while. So essentially, over a few years there with Niels Bohr, um, they decided, well, uh, most of the mass of an atom must be in the center, but a very, very dense, small, positive nucleus, and the electrons must be whirling around them or whatever. And if you remember back in school, what an atom looked like, essentially it looked like what you see there to the right. That's the Atomic Energy Commission in the United States, their logo, and it still has basically a Bohr atom. Well, it doesn't really look like that, but that's essentially the idea back uh, a century ago, how they first envisioned it. Um, so now we've got the electron and the proton. The problem is, if you've got a magnet and you've got a positive and a negative charge, what happens? And I got to make, I, I see some wonderful things going on in uh, chat, but what happens if you've got a, a negative and a positive and they're really close together? What should happen? In other words, you've got an electron and a, and a proton. What should happen? No more atoms, right? Whammo. <laughs> okay. So, wow, okay, but Mike, yep, that's what uh, essentially they came up with. And the idea was um, Enrico Fermi, Paul Dirac, um, they attack, retract. <laughs> wow, attack each other, trap. Okay, so any case, uh, they came up when they go, okay, um, well, and they, they can def hold on to that thought, Shiloh, because essentially the positive ones, if you have positive ones, they would... Uh, shy away from each other, in other words, uh, pull apart. Okay, so um, what they decided in around 1926 is, well, you know, at the really, really small level, these particles must, um, yeah, magnetic attraction, absolutely. And that's what they knew back then. They knew about electricity, knew about magnetism, and they went, okay, if an, if an atom has a positive little center and it's got electrons, the atom should collapse. And so what's keeping it from collapsing? And so essentially, uh, Enrico Fermi, Paul Dirac, uh, they said, okay, let's investigate this a little bit. And what's actually happening is it's not like in our world where um, you could just go about and people don't slam into each other in trees and stuff, although they do in Second Life when they're first walking around, but that's another story. Um, but Essentially, each of these little particles, if they obey Fermi direct statistics, they can only have the same quantum state, essentially occupy the same niche, uh, only one of them can at a time. They have to have something different, like, for example, a different spin, a different um, charge, whatever. Um, and so they came up with the idea of the electron orbitals or the atomic orbitals which we talked a little bit about in uh, when, we talked, when I did a presentation on biochemistry in um, December, I think it was. Okay, and then later on, they found out something called bosons, which essentially carry force. There are things like the photon and some weird little things like gluons and stuff. But uh, essentially fermions, in other words, the ones that uh, behave like this, in other words, can only occupy a certain state, make up our common matter. Okay, more on that. That may be a little confusing, but let's continue. So what do we have right now? We've got 
uh, protons and, and electrons. So this is actually a slide from the biochemistry um, presentation where I started out going, okay, um, in order to talk about chemistry, we have to talk about electron orbitals and we have to talk about, yeah, not with bosos. <laughs> um, yeah, they make up most of the universe. Okay, so um, that's like dark matter. Okay, so in any case, uh, in chemistry, you can't talk about chemistry unless you're talking about electrons and uh, unless you're talking about the um, electron orbitals and such. Okay, so inside the atom, you've got the protons, and we'll find out that you also have neutrons. That was discovered a little bit later. And then you've got the electron orbitals. And essentially, if you can talk about those, you've uh, got a handle on the beginning of chemistry. So where are we now? Well, we've seen this before. I said, uh, spoiler alert. And so now we're talking about electrons. Electrons are, um, yeah. Okay, so electrons really are an elementary particle. You can wham them as hard as you can with a hammer, but they don't splinter into anything else. Protons, though, that's another story. And so we'll continue with the story here. Okay, so we, and look at all the other ones we need to talk about. Okay, so new particles and new forces. By the way, this is all, this is not philosophy. This is not like, gee, I think there's a neutron going on around. Uh, all this is based in math. So what you have above there, for example, is uh, Dirac's equation. It's a relativistic wave equation that kind of uh, combines uh, quantum and relativity, which is cool. Um, and it predicts antimatter. If you look at the, uh, let's see, I don't have my little pointer with me, but I'm, I'm pointing with my cursor and you can't see it. Okay, but um, there is a there's is a factor there is a complex number, the one with the little i at the end right after the equal sign. And essentially, instead of just ignoring the negative value, uh, Dirac uh, said, whoa, this means that there are particles that are uh, every way the same, but they have negative charge or negative something than the other particles, essentially antimatter. So it predicts antimatter, that's cool. Uh, and then Feynman's equation down there, we'll talk about uh, his equation and particle interactions, but this is the last time you'll see the math part. For you guys that are really good at math, um, it's, it's quite interesting, but let's talk about the particles itself. So antimatter, uh, it was predicted back in 1927, the first thing that, um, as predicted. And by the way, what you see there is a cloud chamber view of the very first um, positrons. You can see a little curved, that almost toward the center, you can see little curved lines that go up and go down. And um, essentially what, what you're looking at is um, what happens when an electron lands into or discovers a positron. In other words, matter and antimatter come together and create uh, essentially energy. Um, that, that's the basis of uh, the engines in Star Trek, although that's Hollywood. Um, but antimatter was first predicted in 27 and then uh, detected actually in 1932. So, and then a neutron. Oh, I don't have the uh, um, uh, person who uh, founded um, Neutrons, uh, Chadwick, and I'm trying to remember his first name, but essentially what he did was he bombarded beryllium with alpha particles and it created a neutral ray. In other words, it wasn't meant by magnetic forces. And so he had discovered neutrons. And so people go, wow, this is cool because if you've whammed these little um, nucleuses and you've got both positive things and neutral things, then that means atomic nuclei must contain protons and neutrons. And then in the 30s, now what leads, okay, this is the, this is the beginning of the 30s, so what else did they discover about hitting at atomic nuclei really hard? What, what can also happen if you take, uh, you know, 
neutrons and whack them into uh, nuclei, what happens? It starts A. Here, I'll do. Um, yeah, okay. Syzygy, keep that in mind because there's, there's, there are neutrinos involved here. Um, yeah, well, unfortunately, tagline, uh, yeah, lots of stuff uh, they didn't know about at the, at the time. It's just like, let's see, who put out um, uh, on the uh, Facebook page for a second, for Science Circle, uh, there's a, there was a good one. I think maybe, was it Mike or who put out the one um, catalytic combustion? A chain reaction, yay, uh, day. So uh, that's what would happen. And so, in other words, if you whack into nuclei with a neutron, you're going to get a couple coming off, and then it will come a, a, a um, chain reaction, and that's not good if you've got them really close to each other, because that can become a nuclear explosion. Okay, unless that's your intent. Um, so, in any case, on the science circle on Facebook, you'll see a picture of uh, Madame Curie's notebook where she's taking things, and it's still so radioactive that you, that you shouldn't be near it. And unfortunately, people back then didn't understand that much about uh, radioactivity and uh, x-rays and uh, all, all that they can do to human bodies. Okay, the other thing that was discovered in the, in the 30s were things called mesons. They were actually predicted uh, and then detected later, and then muons. And these uh, were in um, cosmic rays. Now, let's take a moment to reflect on the value of science. This is in the 30s. And then you're talking, yeah, it has to be kept in lead copper. Okay, so uh, because the, the, what comes out of it, which I think are probably beta and some gamma rays and stuff can't get through a certain amount of lead or at least are attenuated. Yeah, very good. Okay, now, uh, Dr. Yukawa was the first uh, Nobel Prize winner in Japan. And I'm, we need to take a pause here because this was the 30s and the 40s. And bear in mind that science and medicine and stuff is one of the one places where you can have people from uh, all different countries and you don't have, and yes, okay, there's politics and science, but basically, uh, you'll see that there's discoveries here made by people all over the world, regardless of what kind of political events are happening at the time. And that's one of the things I love about science. It's much like here with science in Second Life with the science circle, that we have people from all over the world. And that's one of the things that I love the most about it. Um, by the way, and it might be another presentation, but does anyone happen to know, and I'm trying to remember the name, uh, but the person in Germany who also discovered nuclear fusion, et cetera, like that, it was a woman, by the way, and I need to remember her name. Um, okay. So now the second crisis comes along, and I spelt nucleus wrong. The nucleus should fall apart, not fall together, but should blow apart because essentially there's it's a very dense, small little spot that has uh, a lots of positive charges and technically it should fall apart. So how come it doesn't? And so how did they solve the second crisis? Well, essentially they had to come up with different forces than they knew. In other words, remember up till now, we're talking about uh, gravity and electromagnetism. And now they're talking about forces which only occur at the distance of, in other words, they fall off very quickly. They only occur within um, the range of a nucleus. Yeah, nuclear versus nuclear, okay. Nuclear versus nuclear. Um, so, so one of the things was they found out that, wow, there is a strong force that holds protons and neutrons in a nucleus. Uh, nucleus here again being really, 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 really small on the, 10, on the order of 10 to the minus 15 uh, meters. Well, how strong is the strong force? It's 137 times as strong as electromagnetism. Um, it's a million times strong as what we call the weak force, which explains radioactivity. 
And it's an insanely 10 to the 36 times gravity. So gravity really only works when you have lots and lots and lots of little particles. Um, the weak force basically says, well, how come things actually do get ejected from the nucleus and, and unless you actually whack it really hard. In other words, like radioactivities. And so you had several other particles that, yeah, very incredibly strong. And you're right, QCD, where you've got quantum chromodynamics. Uh, uh, yeah, the problem is, is that I have to um, talk about particle physics, philosophy, and the Big Bang all in an hour. <laughs> so I'm trying to kind of explain this together, introducing it. Uh, strong force, yeah, that's... However, comma, wait, wait, sumo, because uh, physicists actually do have a sense of humor, particularly when we get to quarks. Um, so hang on a second. Um, but, you know, call it weak, call it uh, strong, etc. Okay, so here's three more particles. Now, you'll, you'll see down there how a muon, which is one of the little particles discovered, uh, Decays, yeah, well, Q-U-A-R-K, Q-U-A-R-K, Quark, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but essentially, these are what, these diagrams here are what are called uh, Feynman diagrams, and they kind of explain, instead of in math, where everybody might get blurry-eyed unless you're really good at math, charm is uh, one of the properties of a quark, a charm, charmed quark. Um, is they explain how the particles actually interact. So down on the bottom, you've got a muon decaying into a mu uh, neutrino, and also what's called a W minus boson, and then into antineutrino, an electron. And this is, yeah, up, down, top, bottom, charm, <laughs> strange. We'll, we'll get to that in a, in a minute. Hang on a second. Okay, so... Um, any case, where are we now? Well, it's the 30s, and we have discovered two more forces. Uh, strong and weak forces basically occur just in the atomic nucleus. Electromagnetic force is our part of the world. In other words, it explains pretty much everything that goes on in our part of the world. And then you've got to have some really big objects for gravity to really come into effect. Technically, me and my laptop are both attracted to each other uh, gravitationally, but we've got far too few atoms for it to make any difference. So um, electromagnetism takes over in, in most of the part of our world. This is a slide from um, the biochemistry um, presentation I did in uh, December. Just it, now it's in context. And there we go. Okay, so where are we now? Well, I didn't talk about photons, but I did when we were talking about uh, gravity and, and uh, Einstein, uh, because essentially a photon is a, is a force carrier um, with electromagnetism. In other words, we know that uh, if you have light shining on a solar panel that can create elect electrons. Uh, light is what, um, light is what uh, fuels photosynthesis and basically, in other words, creates elect little electrons running around doing their chemical thing in plants. Uh, so photons are force carriers. Um, the same thing also with the W, a light-filled particle. Well, in a way, it it has potential to create light. In other words, if you've got light coming in, it can then bounce an electron basically up to a higher level or uh, electron can lose energy and, and, and create a photon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in fact, actually, okay, that's very good. Actually, photons are, are totally massless. In other words, they don't have any mass. Um, but the... W and Z bosons carry the weak force, and we've, we've talked about those. You've got electrons and then muons. Now, here's a chance, kind of an interesting thing. 
is you've got, if you look at uh, where it says electron and muon, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more, but essentially you've got electrons and the muons behave like electrons, except that they're heavier. And they, everything else is, is pretty much the same, but they're heavier. And then tau particles are like electrons and muons. We, we don't know about those yet. We haven't talked about those yet. Uh, but essentially, those, it's, it's even much heavier than that. And then each of them have a antiparticle, in other words, antimatter. Photons also don't attend mass. Oh my, should I read the chat? Or... <laughs> okay, um, and that's antimatter. So you've got a positron, which is an anti-electron and an anti-muon. Uh, and, and then we talked about a little bit about neutrinos. In other words, each of those particles, electrons, and muons and tau particles have their own uh, flavor, which is an actual really word, word in particle physics, their own flavor of neutrino, um, which can then exchange with each other. So let's keep going. And uh, I'm watching my time a little bit. Let's keep going and talk about some of the other particles. So what they found then, particularly in the uh, 50s uh, and end of 40s, was they started looking and started whacking things into each other and they found oh my goodness there are particles and particles and particles in fact we know of over 200 different particles but are they elementary particles and the answer is no and so that was kind of the next crisis we'll talk about that in a minute but let's let's go ahead and take a look at the category of particles we've got what are called bosons hadrons and fermions fermions uh obey certain statistics um, that keep them from having the same quantum state as each other if they happen to be near each other or the same energy level thing. So, so you've got leptons. I know these are weird names, but you've got leptons, which are essentially the electron, muon, and neutrino. Okay, we've, we've looked at those. We've got what are called baryons, which are like the proton and neutron. And don't look at the quark thing yet, but essentially they have odd number quarks, like either three or five, like a pentaquark, or, uh, which are still being discovered. Or a meson, which have even numbers, like two or four. Um, if you're really getting confused, welcome to the club. It's the same thing as in relativity. It's confusing. But I'm trying to make it a tiny bit less confusing. Um, or bosons, which... Um, are like the photon, the W or Z uh, boson, and then something called, yeah, I know. And then, but what haven't we talked? Uh oh, bosons are very happy to be in the same quantum state. Yeah, that's correct. In other words, bosons are very happy. Fermions are not. Uh, and thank you for clarifying that. In other words, bosons can just um, wander around whatever they want, uh, whereas fermions have particular rules. Uh, about uh, where they can be and what they can do and stuff like that, okay? Um, so on the bosons there, what haven't we talked about? Um, yeah, exactly. Okay, so what is left to talk about? Well, quarks and gluons and things, boson. <laughs> we talked about pretty much the other thing. So let's go ahead and talk about quarks and gluons. I know, see, physicists do have a, a sense of humor. So... Here's what they, this is in the, uh, particularly in the early 60s. Um, you had Mary, you had um, Mary Gilman and um, Yvonne Neiman. We'll come later. Phil Long? <laughs> oh, goody. Yay, yes, Mary Gilman. Okay, so in any case, these guys uh, kind of work together and they go, wow, you know, if we look at all these weird particles that are being discovered like sigma and lambda and chi, um, baryons and delta and, and kaons and pions and atom mesons and all that. And if we look at all of them, we can put them into patterns. And there's groups and you've got the mesons over there that essentially if you look at their strangeness, whether it's one, zero or negative one, and you look at their charge as negative one, zero or one, they can form little octets and, and groups and such. Uh, in fact, actually, 
Does anyone know what this is called? Anyone a particle physicist or? Yeah. As long as also um, Steven Weinberg, who plays a, a part in here. Okay, so anyone know what this is called? It's called the, it's kind of a, an allusion to uh, Buddhism. This is what they actually called this thing. But this is this is a historical note. They basically said, okay, look, these things kind of come in little sections of eight. And so they called it the Eightfold Way, which is really a play on uh, uh, Buddhist. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Weinberg was a <laughs> Okay, so any case, whatever, this is historical note. But the idea is what they were finding was there were so many different particles that were going, well, how can these possibly be related? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so possibly be related. And they said, well, they are. If you look at some of these things, they're related. And so this was the kind of the beginning of figuring out the standard model. In other words, something that would explain everything, not just little parts of it. Now it gets strange. This is, this is for you guys who have been chatting and talking about strangeness. Now it gets strange because there's a strange quark. And so quarks and gluons, uh, where did they come up with the name quark? Well, they were predicted back in the time when I was in college, excuse me, in high school. And I was not a normal high school student. I didn't date in high school. And I sat around with my friends talking about quarks and gluons and uh, the moon and supernovas, and it was a wonderful time to uh, to be interested person back then, um, uh, because this was all happening back in the sixties and seventies. Uh, yeah, now it gets strange. Okay, so quarks were predicted. Here again, you got uh, Mary Jo Man and George Schwieg, I believe. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but I say okay, and then. Quark actually came from a book that, uh, yeah, the name Quark came from. However, comma, if you look, you've got the, the quote up there, three quarks for Mr. Mark, which they actually think meant really three quarks for Mr. Mark, but whatever. It sounded good, and the reason being is because they found out that the, the quarks, when they were predicting them, came in threes. And you had three quarks that made up a proton, three quarks that made up a neutron, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> Talking science and chicks. Only if you have a, but okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, however, comma, what if you have a smart woman? Maybe that person would like to talk about particle physics with me. That's probably the people I would have gone over after at that time. Okay. Um, so, in any case, um, they were detected then. The, the top quark wasn't detected until uh, 1995. But these are weird little particles. And by the way, I may go over a little bit because I started up later. And so hopefully you'll bear with me, but I'll try to keep it to an hour. Is essentially uh, quarks uh, create the most stable particles. In other words, most of the particles we look at are maybe a, a millionth of a billionth of a second or something that they, they stay in existence. In fact, uh, if they're around for a millionth of a second, that's a fairly long time as far as these particles. However, uh, some of the particles, these quarks create the most stable particles, like all of common matter that we know of, uh, like protons and neutrons and stuff. Uh, they're, they also uh, make up the nucleus uh, and interact, not necessarily responsible for, well, gluons and quarks, they are what, are ex gluons are exchanged between quarks, quarks to create the strong force. They're the only particle that can experience all of the forces. In other words, gravity, electromagnetism, weak and strong force. Um, and you can't find a single one of them, except for in the theor in theoretical thing called a quark gluon plasma, which was at the beginning of the uh, universe. Um, blah, 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 okay. Higgs boson. Uh, okay, they they cannot exist as freestanding particles. There's what's called color. It, it has to do with chrom, uh, what somebody put earlier, quantum chromodynamics. And basically, it's a 
conservation of color. And so they can't, color is like another property. It really isn't color. It's just uh, what we call it. And so color has to be conserved. And so they can't actually, yeah, chrom yeah quantum uh, chromodynamics, Q QCD. And so they can't show up as a single one. They have to be combinations of two, three, and then later on four or five are some more exotic uh, things we've seen in this century. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, ducks out. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, hey, let me see if um, uh, one of the slides here, I had that, and we'll probably see it again, otherwise I'll go back. Okay, Higgs bosons are even weirder, and basically they're the ones that there's what's called the Higgs mechanism, which explains why particles have mass. And what you see there is the relative masses of the different particles. The little gray one on the bottom left is actually, um, let's see, what is it? It's an electron and something else. <laughs> um, the other ones are the quarks up there. You've got bottom top quark being almost as heavy as a gold atom. Uh, they didn't discover that one until 1995. And then some of the other ones up there, the uh, uh, charmed and strange and then up and down quarks on the top of our quark. Okay, let's keep going. By the way, uh, when you get to things like the Higgs boson and the top quark and things, it's no longer one person sitting in a room with a glass tube trying to discover the stuff. In the case of the Higgs boson, it took 3,000 physicists, 183 institutions, 38 countries, and a lot of time and a lot of energy, literally, <laughs> to discover this thing. <coughs> in fact, the detector was 25 meters in diameter and about 45 meters long. And just you're talking about a huge, big thing where you whack stuff into each other. Uh, you're correct. Syzygy there. In other words, actually, that was where the names that they used early on truth and beauty instead of top and bottom but they did top and bottom because they already had up and down and they figured top and bottom would go with those but i like truth and beauty better frankly okay so we've essentially covered the particles here again i'm, I'm looking at one hour just i started 15 minutes late so i'll be uh, done by then Let's see, what's uh, Baragon saying? Um, da, 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 da. This is uh, particles neutralize, use energy of... Yeah, okay, that's... Um, somebody else might want to answer that, but yeah, there are virtual uh, part of, in other words, things that you can get straight out of energy uh, in empty space. So what's next? You've got this thing that they uh, basically finalized in the 70s. That's quite a while ago. And so what do we do next? Well, first of all, the standard, we have cats. Yeah, and cats will tell you what dog means. Okay, so the standard model, what's missing? Well, the strength is it predicts three or four of the fundamental forces and accounts for everything we know. That's amazing. However, comma, it doesn't describe gravity, doesn't describe general relativity, doesn't describe dark matter or accelerating universe. It doesn't say that we should have neutrino masses, which we do, uh, very, very small. So we still have to discover that, which is cool because if we discovered everything, it'd be boring. So we still have lots of cool things to uh, discover. It's just the standard model explains an enormous amount and that's why it's been around for 50 years. Now, for you guys that um, like this stuff, uh, the Big Bang, one of the things about learning about these little particles is we know a lot more about what happened at the beginning of the universe. And what I mean by that is like, within um, the first millionths of a second or so. And what actually happened, if you look at the far right, there was, a, there was unified fields, okay? The, all forces were united. And then at a, at a very, very uh, small amount of time, the gravity kind of froze out. In other words, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Um, so you have gravity that froze out of there. So gravity now is different than the other force. Excuse me, forces. And then the strong force separates and electro force, weak forces. Now, if you look at the very top, CERN 
The reason why they have to have so much energy there is they're trying to explore the world of the very high energy. The last time some of these particles like quarks were actually seen, so to speak, um, and not frozen in protons and neutrons uh, was back at the beginning of the universe. And so the maximum energy of CERN is about 10 to the 7 giga electron volts, which basically means that you can explore this early part of the universe, because this is how much energy there would have been around with particles smashing into each other at the very beginning. And so you take a look at this, you got the Big Bang going on. There's a, there's a area called one inflationary um, epic. We won't talk about that yet, because we could talk about this whole thing in, uh, in one, in fact, I might <laughs> someday. Yeah, quark soup in the far back. And essentially what you've got is at one time, all there were were little electrons, positive, uh, uh, and then protons and neutrons all wandering around and gluons and stuff all wandering around. There wasn't any atoms, there wasn't any ions, there wasn't any stars yet. Uh, just all these things at incredibly high temperatures, all like trillion degrees, all just running into each other, just like uh, uh, in CERN. And then you had uh, the actual um, things we know today, and then you had atoms. Uh, basically, there was a time when matter overtook antimatter, and I spelled that one wrong too, antiomatter. Um, and about one second into uh, the Big Bang, we had basically mostly matter and antimatter all disappeared pretty much. Um, and then we had uh, atoms forming at 3,000 years, and then suddenly you see the the darker area over there to the right of that cone, essentially uh, that is a really cool time because then atoms formed and all of a sudden the universe would become black. In other words, it was transparent. You could see and stars form, the galaxies form. That's the hatching of the cosmic egg, absolutely. So that is formed the universe as we know today. And then, well, what else? And here again, I'm watching my time. I'll be there in a couple minutes is essentially, this is another view, and I've got the, uh, this is in Quantum Magazine, uh, and I've got the, back in 2020 in, in October, somebody imagined the standard model, instead of being flat, like on a piece of paper, uh, they imagine it like this. And there's your colors, by the way, red, green, blue. And you've got your, um, you've got your three generations of each particle, a quark over there on the left, and you've got your anti uh, quarks over the right, and the Higgs boson in the middle, create, uh, creating uh, mass uh, on there. And just, it's kind of a beautiful little thing because, and then the neutral color ones are um, uh, the other particles, uh, leptons and stuff, just cool, cool, cool stuff like that. And basically, we only have a small number of elementary particles, even though we've detected lots of different uh, bigger ones that are all composed of those. Now, I, and I will leave you with this. I, I always like to see some of this stuff. But over on the left, this was actually going around for several years. This, this is what they hoped to see if they detected the Higgs boson. Uh, and indeed, they found it uh, because this is, this is a prediction of what they would see because the Higgs boson, yeah, I love it. Uh, would would um, break down, and this is what they predicted to see at CERN, and they did. And then over on the right is a very fantastic kind of um, view of what those two big reds and the blue are essentially up and down quarks, and then you've got little gluons, and they're all interacting. Yeah, I think so too. It's a very imaginative type of view of what could be happening inside a proton. Very, very cool. Okay, and that is my presentation for today. Uh, does anyone, and let me see, it's gotta be raising it. Okay, there you go. Anyone have any questions, comments? A great Christmas tree. Yes, well adorned, I agree, beautiful. Okay, um, I hope you got something out of this. Particle physics is not a, um... oh, thank you. Okay, it's not a subject that you um, take lightly. <laughs> But the idea is uh, that I, I hope to give you an idea of how we learn some of this stuff, uh, that there isn't just an infinite amount of 
things, but everything in the universe is um, created by just uh, a few little elementary particles. And it's cool. It's all been done within, you know, not that long. Okie dokie. What do we have? Ooh, yes. Go for it. Thank you all for coming. And what do we have next week? We should advertise that. Oh, good point there. Okay. Yeah, so far so good. <laughs> when you're falling, that's a, that's a, a good dialogue. Then. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, what do we got next week? I got to look it up. Yeah, we should we should advertise what we um, have next week. A panel? Do do panel. Ministry for the future on the um, 27th. And then more about dinosaurs and Metamphetamines and just all kinds of cool stuff. Lion spiders, yeah. That's a, so physicists do have a sense of humor. You know, you got charm and strange and truth and beauty and. Has to be observed to be funny. <laughs> okay, I was wondering about the ministry part. Created in the Paris Climate Accords. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> 